Hello everyone. Welcome to Cracked with Siobhan Aris. I'm your host, Siobhan Aris, because my name's Siobhan, but you can call me Chevy. The grandfather of the copper foil technique, New York glass artist Louis Tiffany, first commercially produced his namesake Tiffany lamps in 1895. Since then, many beautiful lamps have been made, of course, but currently all eyes are on Brooklyn-based stained glass table pyramid lamp and pendant maker, Friend of All Glass. The company is led by Flannery Cronin, and she's designed a modern partnership of electricity and stained glass that's taking the lighting world by storm, one switch at a time. Join me as I crack it all wide open. Hello, Flannery. Hello. Hello, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? I'm doing very, very, very well, thank you. I think it's always funny when um, when we say hello because we've, I don't know if you listened to my last one, but I said, hi, Debbie, and we both started like cracking up because we've yeah. actually been talking for a couple minutes. We haven't spoken right. about glass yet, but we've been getting the, the meeting set up. So here's my fake, hello, how are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> um, Flannery, you are at the helm of, Friend of All Glass. Um, Friend of All Glass is synonymous with like table lamps and hanging pe- pendant lamps and night lights. And that's kind of been your corner of the market. You yes. have a very identifiable product, um, as Neely said. She also, if you listen to her interview, she suggested you be on the podcast. And this yes. didn't make it into Debbie's interview, but she also suggested you be on the podcast. Oh, that's so sweet. I know. And then I also did a um, a little Instagram poll and I said, hey, who do you guys want on the podcast? And there was a few people that um, suggested you there as well. So I think we're going to have some really happy listeners to hear you you speak to us today. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, so tell us where you're from. So I'm from Arkansas, actually. Um, I was born in Fayetteville. Um, my sister, I always borrow this from my sister because she always says that we were um raised by a pack of wild hippies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm the baby of three, and my mom, uh, both my parents were artists and like entrepreneurs. So it's kind of been like, you know, in our family line to kind of make your own way in the world. Um, my mom is an interior designer and she was a modern dancer. Like when I was a kid, she would teach modern dance to like all the other single divorced women, um, like out of our home growing up in oh, Arkansas. Wow. And my father was a uh, woodworker. And then my stepdad who raised us a furniture maker. Um, yeah. So, but we moved around a lot. So I lived, uh, my mom, like her whole deal was moving into a house, flipping it, living in it for a little while and then moving on. So I think before I went to college, we lived in like, I think I counted recently, it was like 12 different houses or something. Um, and all over the South. So born in Arkansas, lived in, uh, Texas and then North Carolina, um, until I went to college in Savannah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Cause you don't have a Southern accent at all. I know it's weird. My mom is so Southern and my dad was, but my, um, my siblings and I, I think maybe cause we moved so much, but yeah, we don't have much. If we get drunk, it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just you and your sister. And I have a brother. Okay. And are they artists as well? Um, my sister is, she's like a writer. Um, she's, I always say she's a poet, but she's not like practicing. Um, and, but she kind of got into like the healthy eating specialist world. She worked for Whole Foods for a while as a healthy eating specialist. And then um, got into, she worked for like Garden of Life. Uh, the probiotic company. So she's more in like the nutrition world. And then my brother, Dakota lives in Shanghai and he's a teacher. Okay. So we have Dakota Flannery and what's your sister's name? Annabelle. I'm named after Flannery O'Connor, the writer. Um, It's not a family name. It was just like a a novelist my mom really liked. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of neat then that your sister ended up being a writer. Right. I know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. Siobhan is also a very Irish name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, barely anybody knows what I'm talking about when I say this, but there used to be a soap opera called Ryan's Hope that was on many, many years ago. Okay. And my dad used to watch it with my great grandmother every day oh. um, when he was little. And there was an actress on there named Siobhan. And so oh. that's who I'm named after. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't like that in- is your yeah. so is your family from Ireland or they just liked that soap? They just liked the name. They just liked the soap. Yeah. Yep. Nothing else. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And then my brothers um, also have, well, I think, so I have Ryan Christopher, which is more like, I think more English. Yeah. And then Sean Patrick, John Patrick. Okay. Is, is okay. Also very Irish. So Yeah. All right. We have the Irish namesakes. And then yes. you're up, like my whole family when they came, my dad's side, when they came from Ireland, they landed in Massachusetts. So Aww. like, there's a bunch of Cronins up there, like distant cousins and stuff that I don't even know, but apparently, apparently there's a lot of family members up there. I'll keep Do you my know eye Haver out. Haverhill? Hill, Haverhill Hill. He says it differently in his accent, but it's, is he a stained glass artist? No, no. That's the town in Massachusetts. My oh. Grandma <laughs> oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Um, I, okay. So I just moved to Massachusetts in January. Okay. And, um, you know, when you, when you move all the way across the country and you are trying to like set your life back up, you don't get out a lot. And so I feel like I'm just now starting to like venture out and see, um, what's happening in Massachusetts. So what, what? Cause when we first started communicating online, you were in uh, by Portland, Oregon, right? Somewhere around Portland. Uh-huh. Yeah. What brought you guys? To so Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, you know, we were, so we moved to Portland from Los Angeles, um, kind of looking for, um, a little cleaner, a little quieter, a little slower, but like still a city. Um, okay. and we were there for three years and, um, you know, I love all my Portland people, but Portland just wasn't our city. It just didn't work out. And yeah. so we wanted, and it, also with COVID and everything that was happening, we were kind of like, maybe this is the time for us to be just outside of a city, but like not in the city. We're city people. Yeah. We need to go to the city. But like right now we just wanted to kind of like, you know, not be on top of everybody. Yep. And, um, and so we were looking for a community within, um, within a certain amount of distance within striking distance of a large city. So okay. we were looking around Portland. Sorry, this is going to like take me on a whole story. No, I, I wanted to know. <laughs> so we were looking for a community within an hour of Portland. And we just, we would find these amazing pieces of property, but we weren't sure if like the town was right for us. It was just right. a little bit too, you know, we're, we are liberal and we wanted to live it, live in a liberal community and Oregon generally is not very liberal. Um, so, and then we were like, well, maybe we'll move back to Southern California, you know, but then none of those places were really speaking to us either. So we were kind of stumped and, um, and we had some friends in LA. We have some friends in LA who are on a similar trajectory as us where they wanted to move to a smaller place, but that was still like happening kind of. Yeah. And we explained to them what we were looking for. And they were like, you guys want to move to the Berkshires. Oh. And I was like, oh my God, I had never even like thought about the East coast. And I yeah. used to co- go to New York every other month for work. Um, okay. and I did that for a couple of years. Um, a while ago. Now this is like, you know, now I'm talking about like eight years ago. So I know New York okay. is very different now than it was then, but that was my only experience with the East coast, but I loved it. I loved it. I loved New York so much. Yeah. And so I was like, Oh my God, it felt like this like new frontier, like, you know, I'm in my early forties. And so I thought, you know, this is just kind of like where I'm at now I'm married and I have a child. And I was like, no, like, like the world is your oyster. <laughs> you can move to the yeah. East coast. Yeah. So we're now, um, in a place that is a very specific ecosystem that was super difficult to find where we are in a rural area, but yeah. there's a lot of focus on arts and culture here, which is what we were looking for in those other places, but we couldn't really find. Yeah. Um, I keep telling people that the Berkshires is like country living for city folk because yes. everybody here is from the city 
and the city is so close. So we can kind of like make day trips if we want to. Boston is also like just a couple hours away. That's so cool. Yeah. And my daughter is six. So, um, it's so clean here. It is so safe here. We are so happy with like the personal attention we're getting from the public school system. And, um, yeah. So anyway, so beautiful up there. It's like a fairyland. I've only been in the middle of summer a few times, like swimming in the creeks and it is like, yeah. I mean, they call it the Shire, right? Oh, my light just went off. Should I turn it back on? No, you look great. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay. No, that's okay. Um, it is super beautiful here. It's like, it's, it's, I keep saying it's, yeah, (laughs) I'm at my curse right now. Um, (laughs) but we live in the middle of a nature preserve. So you have to drive through this like meadow that is the nature preserve and then like up this really steep hill. And then, you know, we're surrounded on, on all sides by jug end reservation. Um, and then we have like five acres right in the middle of it. And it's totally, we have, so we, we don't have any neighbors on three sides of us. Oh my gosh. That sounds like a dream. It's a dream. (laughs) The internet, however, is a nightmare, but (laughs) we're, we're, we're figuring it out. And you have not shoveled snow yet. No, we have. Oh, you have. Yeah. Cause we moved here in January. Oh, in January. Okay. So, you know, okay, that's good. That's good to go in the moment where you like see it at the height of winter. (laughs) <laughs> it is so winter wonderland. Like, you know how in a city when it snows, it's pretty for about 10 minutes and then it just turns into like dirty slush and it's just like yeah, it's yeah. a pain in the ass and it makes everything more difficult. But here it's so like every, it's such a postcard everywhere that you look that it doesn't even matter that it's a pain in the ass. And honestly, because we are in an area where precipitation is a real thing. And in the winter, it snows so much. They're on top of it in terms of plowing the roads. And oh, I mean, good. the roads are actually way better here than they were. Like when it would still in Portland, it would be like mayhem and everything would shut down if there was like two snowflakes in the sky. Yeah, yeah totally. They're not used to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, which they should be. It well, happens cool. every year, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, good. I'm, I was like curious to know. I didn't know if you had family there or like no. what brought you, Yeah, friends. we had never even been here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had never been here. And we, you know, on paper, it checked all the boxes of what we were looking for. And so we were like, F it. Let's sell our house here. Let's buy a house there. We're going to go on an adventure. We're due for one. And if yeah. it doesn't work out, like we, this is our, um, this is the fourth time we've moved in a very, sh- like in this, in less, you know, since my daughter was born six years. Oh, wow. You're and ready so, to, uh, we're right. ready to yeah. settle, but we also yeah. are like, we know how to do, like, we know how to move. We know that it's okay. nothing. It's not precious. Like if it doesn't work out, we can just keep it moving and we'll keep moving until we find our spot. So, um, Man, that is like you're describing, I think everybody's situation right now. Like yeah. everyone I know, including myself and my partner, had the moment of during COVID for whatever reason, where all the things that don't quite work right are really under a magnifying glass. And you're like, yeah. I'm ready for something totally different. Because um, I've been here for 13 years in New York. And I told we had to reschedule because we just bought a house in Philly. And my closing date was our, when our first... Uh, interview was supposed to be so I had to reschedule but um yeah we just did the same thing and it's scary to to make a change but we're yeah. like same thing we're we keep talking if we don't like it we can you know we it doesn't have to be permanent like it makes it feel a little better in your mind to know yeah. I have the power I know how to move I've done it before if we don't like it we can go on it's yeah. so true. There is this feeling of like, there's no going back, you know, like once you make a shift and it's like, actually there, there totally is like, there's very yeah. much a going back if that's what you choose to also, do. Like how many decisions have you made in your life where you looked back and you were like, shouldn't have done that. <laughs> like oh, yeah. you're always, okay. You know, for the most part, you dive into the next place and you, you know, like you, you do your best, you make friends, you live, you're still you, you're just in a different place. Yeah. And then it's like a new thing to learn. Um, I think with COVID too, you know, we were all at a point where we weren't seeing our friends anyway. We hadn't seen people in like six months, seven months. And so it was like, well, 
I'll probably see them more often because I'll make more of an effort. It will be more right. of like an intentional thing. Like I miss you now. I really need to see you. Sometimes exactly. I feel like I see people that live like in LA more often than I see people that live, you know, an hour away from me. Cause there's that exactly. comfort yeah. of knowing that they're right there. That makes you not actually for, do the trip. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. How far yeah. is the commute for you now that you're living in Philly? Um, so I'm not, we won't be living there full time until probably December or even we have like some, I have a big project right now. I I have to finish first and then, uh, Tim has some stuff going on. So we didn't think we were going to get this house. Um, so it kind of like, we got it like under asking and all these things that are not, um, normal in this market. So we Mm -hmm. kind of were like, let's just try. And then didn't expect it to happen. So we're kind of slowly working on it um, and we will be not moving down until um, probably December, but it will be two hours once we are there. Um, But my plan is to, I'm going to have a studio there where I do all my custom stuff and then my, um, my team will stay here for our showroom appointments and like made to order stuff. So also in the first year, I'll probably have to be up here once a week. Um, and I'll probably just sleep in the studio. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a little air mattress and <laughs> yeah. Um, Tell me the about fact- the studio that you have in, it's in Greenpoint, right? It's in Greenpoint. Um, so I have this, like this massive stained glass wall, um, divides the messy part of the studio is behind it. Let me see if I can kind of show you. I have a huge desktop, but you can kind of see like, you see my glass in the back there. Yeah. So this is for those of you listening, remember this is on YouTube. So you can actually watch and see what she's showing us right now. We have a huge wall to wall, ceiling to ceiling, uh, ceiling to floor, (laughs) uh, stained glass wall that we built in my studio and there's sliding doors in the middle and it divides my where we make all the lamps and there used to be a storefront and until the pandemic in the front um but now we changed it and it's a showroom so we kind of do like messy stuff in the back and then we can do all the presentable stuff in the front but if I have a showroom appointment or a meeting I can just close the doors and it does a pretty good job like muffling the sound of all our ventilation fans and grinders and Mm. um and even like if, if they're soldering, it won't let the fumes in the front. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then I have a, a showroom in the front that is essentially it was my display for my trade shows. And when they all got canceled because of the pandemic, um, my Tim was like, let's just take them out of storage and set it up in the front. And so you can see all, I think we have like 40 lamps or something in our full line. So they're all like, I'm looking at it now, but they're all um, set up and turned on all the time. So people can kind of look in through the windows and we're in a very like walking neighborhood. So we get a lot of business from people who are just like walking their dog and they're yeah. like lured in by the lights. Um, and then, but it is by appointment only. So we don't, we don't have walk-ins. We're trying to keep like, I know that th- we feel like we're in like a little bit of a break from COVID, but um, keeping my staff safe and not disrupting this workspace is kind of my, my top priority. So we don't, we don't do, um, drop-ins yeah. anymore. I have to <laughs> say that because people are always trying to bust through. I had to lock the door because people are always busting in being like, what are you doing in there? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Oh so, yeah. Um, and when you say your staff, how many people do you have working for you now? I have, um, four, Four. Yeah. Four, five. I have five people working for me now. Um, all part-time, um, before the pandemic, because we had the store also, I had 10 employees. Um, and then like half of them just overnight were like, we left, we don't live in New York anymore. Oh, wow. Um, and mostly the, the deal with that was, um, nobody wants to work in a retail store. <laughs> Like it's the most boring job and some days it's busy and it's exciting. And then some days nobody comes in. So I was able to get reliable 
workers for the store when we had the retail shop open by saying in your downtime, I can train you in stained glass and you can help us with our production. So then we got all these like wonderful overqualified people who wanted to learn. Um, and then that was like a nice way of getting them trained up for when it was our holiday season and we needed more hands on deck. And you normally um, teach classes. So you had like a flow in terms of like, all right, start, this is yeah. going to start with A and we're going to end with Z. Exactly. And this is how you like learn how to do stained glass. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like right before the pandemic, we had just gotten to this like just incredible stage of like so many, I don't know, like so much like really high level production. And we had trained, we put all this work in training all these people. And it was finally like, all right, like I can see how this is going to, be really good and then like I'm sure everyone that you'll interview and I already heard it on your other two interviews like everyone experienced the like screeching stop you know mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. like all we all diversify our streams of income and so you think if I just hustle and I work as hard as I can and mm -hmm. I have four different inroads you maybe never start a podcast maybe if I <laughs> yeah, yes exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so tell me more about your storefront. It was a collective and I love the business plan of how you put this thing together because it wasn't like a normal storefront. Tell us more about how that worked. I know you had 13 different artists that you, go ahead. Yeah. I'll let you explain it actually. Uh, yeah. So it was called FOA collective, like friend of all collective. Um, and I put together, it was usually about 13 members, but, um, I only, ha I think I only had them commit to six months at a time because I wanted, I run my own business too. So I know things can change. And so I, I didn't want people to feel trapped, but most people stayed on indefinitely. Um, but they were different, local, semi-local. We actually had a few California artists and I think we had some people from Philly. Um, but the, the criteria was that it was like a handmade product um, and that the in the beginning, anyone who was local would work, you know, a couple shifts a month in the store. So the customers loved it. They could come in and meet the actual artist. Um, and most of them, there might be like a, a an, uh, if they did like any kind of consignment or commission stuff, they could come and meet them in person. Um, but everyone paid them a monthly membership fee and that covered rent, utilities, insurance, all that stuff. And then they got a hundred percent of their sales. I didn't take any, um, I didn't take any percentage of the sales. Um, because I also like, it, it just made it to where we basically all had our own showroom, you know, without having, I think yeah. it was only like $300 a month or two fifty, or something like that for each person. It was really affordable yeah. because I already paid half the rent for the back half of the studio, you know? Right. Um, right. Um, but then after like a year, like the website's still up for the store. If anyone wanted to go look at all the artists we had, I kept it up because it's got all their links. So people still call me wanting like the shower curtains we sold for quiet home, quiet town home. Um, so I'm like, you can still go buy from them <laughs> directly, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'll include that link in the show notes, but what is the website in case people are just listening? Um, it's FOA Collective dot com I think okay <laughs> yeah FOA, or it might be FOA Collective NYC but um I haven't like thought about that website for a minute so I'll double check but okay um, and I'll and again I will put it in the show notes we'll double check and make okay. sure it's in there um okay so that means so yeah. you, we didn't touch on the classes yet but you were also teaching classes are you still doing those no we're not doing classes again because like just having random people in and like messing up our workspace for, for my staff. We just, no one was comfortable with it. And um, so we haven't done that. I kept thinking that when the vaccinations were in play, but then we got this Delta variant and yeah. um, like we're, I don't have an outside space here. So it's, it's a small space. So we're just, we're not going to mess with it until, until we know it's totally safe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I love teaching classes. And I think that's how you and I first started talking because mm -hmm. we were both working that out. Um, yeah. You had already been teaching. I actually reached out to you and I said, I want to start teaching. I was still in Portland and I yeah. was like, can I please pick your brain? I want to know yeah. um, what's working for you and what's not. And um, so let's, let's count that as the first time I interviewed you. And so this is. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I, I mean, teaching is such a, it feels like so much work. And it, at first you're like, this is going to be disruptive from my own work, but it makes you clean your studio. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're really organized. Um, you can't mess around with the safety stuff. So it, it made me like kind of re-up all of that. Um, and then everyone's so charged up from it at the end. Like mm-hmm. you really feel like you're giving a gift to people and then getting paid for it. So it's great. It's like, honestly, it's, I love, 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 love teaching. I teach like three or four workshops a week and I still do. Oh, I am right now. Do. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, I, I used to teach yoga. I like did like a small chapter of okay. teaching yoga. Cause I love yoga so much. I was like, I think I want to be a teacher and I hated it. <laughs> I hated teaching. Yoga. I just didn't, it, it was. Yeah. And so I doing your own practice, right? hundred percent, totally yeah. different. And teaching yoga is so different than teaching glass. And I know that everybody listening is probably like, why are we talking about teaching yoga? But I mean, going into teaching glass, I was like, what if I hate it? Like I hated teaching yoga, yeah. but I love it. It's the best. Yeah, it is great. I mean, and people like, that's, what's so great about this craft is you, if you break it down, it's simple techniques nothing's really hard about it you can mm-hmm. spend a lot of money but you don't have to like you can do it with all hand tools you can do it in your apartment or your home you don't have to have like a separate studio I mean you probably should but in the like I started out in my apartment um but yeah it's like it's it's very accessible um and then after like a, a day's like concentration you've got a thing you have like a finished thing that you can hang up and look at and be proud of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the first piece I made, um, finishing it and then showing it to my husband. And he was like, you made that. And he said it, like you say, it's like a kindergartner, like you made that honey. And I was like, I did, I made this. And it is, it's like this, like tactile, like experience of like holding something and it's heavy and it's, it's sturdy yet fragile at the same time. And it, it really is like, it's like nothing else. It's and really like, cool. there's something about, so did you make a, a piece to hang in your window? Was that the first thing you made? The yeah. Yeah. It's like a panel. Yeah. Yeah. And those like, it does totally transform a space. Like you posted something on your Instagram recently that a customer had sent you and they, it was like, they had hung your piece in their kitchen above the sink. Mm-hmm. And oh yeah staring at it and they were like we can't stop staring at it it's changing the vibe of the whole house and that I mean it's it's like that's what colored glass does when like light pours through and you have the shadow play and the textures um I did this but way before I was even doing stained glass or interested in it I I did a um I was like studying in London with my college I did like a study abroad art history thing Mm -hmm. one summer and we did a tour of all these churches. Um, and I remember I'm not religious at all. And I grew up, like I said, pack of wild hippies. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I always felt a little weird about being in churches, not because I feel like I'm a devil worshiper or anything. <laughs> like I, I respect religion and spirituality, but I just felt like, is it disrespectful for me to be in here if I don't believe, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but we went on like a educational thing and we, we went through all these beautiful churches and the historian that was giving us the tour had said this, I'm not going to be that articulate, but he had said the the whole idea about stained glass in these um, old, like 1800 built in the 1800s churches was that like these churches are stone and it's cold when you walk in and it's dark. So you have this like feeling in your body with the temperature change and then your pupils are adjusting because of the light change and then Mm -hmm. light is pouring through this glass window and it gives you chills and it makes you feel that you're feeling the divine presence, you know? And he was like, it's kind of manipulative, (laughs) but also it's like, it's also real because there's all these people pumping their love for God or, you know, whatever it is into this space and that's palpable. But when he said that it stuck with me for so long because it is like, it's a, it's an art form that interacts with you on all these different sensorial levels. And then it'll change at different times of light and day and artificial light. And, um, so I just, I think that's so cool. And I think about it all the time, large scale or small scale, you can, you can really 
you can play with that. And then you've got texture and opacity and like your stuff's like really opaque normally, right? Well, no, your big panels are transparent. Yeah, I don't really have a theme. I just kind of, yeah. you know, cool glass is cool glass, whatever it is. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but with my lamps, I always, um, because the light source is right there, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't use a lot of transparent glass because I personally, I don't like to see the hardware. The I don't like yeah, the yeah, that makes sense. Bulb. And I don't think it's pleasant to stare at a light bulb when it's on. So I like to use um, glass that's either like more on the opaque side or frosted or something so that it disperses the light. And um, so getting to finally start doing stuff like this where I can play with transparent glass, um, it was actually after visiting Neely's cabin that I was like, cause she's so like, oh my God, like her, I love her so much. <laughs> her a, a moment, way, a moment of silence for Neely right now, yeah. just out of respect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the way, not only that she just uses great like texture, but she, she like plans it to where like the grain of it, if it was wood or whatever, like matches up, you know, like, yes. she'll cut it. so there's like a pattern and I don't have the patience for that. And I'm so, I, I'm like, so I can't, I'm so in awe at um, the, the way that she uses her illustrations and incorporates the glass and finds the perfect piece. And yeah. Yeah. yeah she's a true <laughs> artist. She is. Um, well, in terms of the play of light and glass together, you have brought those two things that are natural partners together in such a way that um, truly has made a product that is so recognizable and it does make sense. Like, light and glass together and you've done an amazing job. You really have. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you're making some custom pieces, right? Yes. So, um, our, we, I started out only doing all the lamps. Um, and we would only do custom if someone wanted like different colors and a lamp. I, I, I didn't do, wall hanging. I mean, sorry, I didn't do panels, sun catchers. I didn't do any of that stuff starting out because I was, I was really conscious of trying to stay in my own like lane. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that were, um, do There was like, actually there's way more now, but I feel like when I was first starting to pay attention, there was like a handful of well-known contemporary stained glass artists who I'm sure will all be on your podcast. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, I don't, I knew it was a little bit of a competitive world and I'm friend of all, like, I want to make sure everyone knows I'm supportive and there's enough room for all of us. So I was like really focused on only doing the lamps. Um, and then now I realize that's stupid and you know, I can, <laughs> I can do whatever I want. I just have to make sure my designs are original. Yeah. Um, so now, now that all my lamps are made to order. Um, so we have these set designs and my, incredible staff is trained, um, to, to do like the patterns are made, the templates are made. Um, like we're so organized that everything's cut up in like, if you take like one, any one of my lamps and you look at all the pieces that are in it, we've got them cut and ground and they're in drawers ready to go. So oh, when the, cool. when, when it order comes in, we just foil and solder it. Um, and so that's pretty, that's finally a well-oiled machine. My staff can handle that. And then I focus on the custom stuff. And that was new. Like I just started doing that. Um, I want to say in 2019, um, the girl who helps me with my website was like, let's just put a tab on your website with an or with a form people can fill in if they have custom ideas. And it was the easiest. I didn't have to put any effort out. And then they just flooded in. Um, so I have a waiting list that's pretty long now of custom orders. Um, so when I finish this big one we're working on now, there's a lot of very patient people <laughs> waiting on me. So, yeah. Uh, so I, that's how I was able to like continue my interest in all of this was to, to focus more on the custom stuff because it's been like five years of me making the same lamps and it's, it's that's boring. A lot. That's, that's a lot <laughs> yeah. of lamps. Yeah. Um, do you, when you're doing your custom work now, I know the lamps are predominantly copper foil, correct? Yeah. Everything I do is copper foil. I don't okay. do lead at all. Yeah. Okay. 
So even your customs are copper foil as well. Yeah. Even the big stuff, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I do feel rebar reinforcement for everything, but, Oh, that's uh, cool. But I, um, I, and I, I'm at this project, I was like, maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm focused too much on this, but I, I feel like I like the look of copper foil better. Mm. I feel like it looks really handmade, like every inch of the piece, you know, like it's, um, but, uh, with this piece, like how many times I broke a piece and had to like repair it. And they're six feet tall. They're huge, you know? Yeah. Um, so now I'm like, maybe I'm going to start playing with <laughs> a lead game. <laughs> yeah, I know. I took a class, a lead class, like, I guess about four years ago now. And I made like a little piece and I, I feel like I need to take another, um, yeah. like class. Cause I, I only do copper foil as well, but there's some jobs that, you know, some jobs you know where I'm like, I know it'd be better if I had lead instead. I yeah. just need to like freshen up. Well, and like yours, that recent really tall one you did, um, you have so many solder lines in there. So mm -hmm. even though it's big, it's probably really sturdy. Um, yeah, in the frame too, I, I, I used like a really thick brass okay. cane. Yeah. But and it's so still, it's still, you know, you still have to be careful with it, like how you pack, pick it up. Cause it could, yeah, you know, give a little bit. Yes. It's got a, a wobble. A little wobble if you're not yeah. careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My husband built a stand for it and there's a, there's like the, the, you know, the came frame, but then there's also like a wood stand that comes up really tall on it and it slides inside of the wood oh, frame. Good. Oh, and it nice. has feet yeah. on it. So it's kind of like. Oh, it's um, not hanging. It's a standing piece. It is a standing piece until somebody purchases it and says, I want it hanging. And then I'll yeah. put hooks on it. But I yeah. didn't want to put the hooks on because I thought, well, what if somebody buys it and they want it hanging, but they want it lengthwise? I don't want to put the hooks on the end. So yeah. I kind of wanted to be able to stand it up and have it, you know, have some options for. That's smart. And also what I have found that I'm doing more of these custom pieces that I'm working with interior designers or architects, like who I'm not dealing directly with the client. They always want the frame to match the trim or the wood in the house. So like whatever you choose is not necessarily going to be what they need. You know, yeah. like every piece I do, we're figuring out what's all the other wood, what's the paint you use, what's, you know, and they're very specific because right. people own the, their houses and they've planned all of that out or it's a commercial space and there's a whole interior design team. So, right uh, now the piece that's behind you that the wall divider yeah. Is that framed into wood? How is that framed? This piece is, um, so, uh, so this is a huge wooden, um, framework. Okay. And the idea originally, like I can't go high enough, was that each piece would just, it'd be a full piece in each negative space, but I didn't, um, I didn't plan it out properly. <laughs> so these negative spaces ended up being too big. There was not a sheet of glass I could get that was that big. So I, I did like a very, the most simple solder line I could. Yeah. And then they're stuck in and then there's um, like stops basically in the back of the frame. Okay. The, the, the wall that just hold them into place. Got it. Um, and when you say stops, explain those. Cause so there's not a channel in the wood frame. There's there, it's just setting in there and oh. then there's stops behind it. So if you imagine the, the, okay, if this were tilted down flat, mm -hmm. the front of it makes like an L shape okay. and the frame and the glass goes in it. So this okay. is the front. Okay. And then we just come in with pieces of wood and oh, okay. underneath and it sandwiches it in, but they're nailed in so that we can, or they're like screwed in so we can remove those. Got it. But it, it holds it in. It holds it in place. Okay. Um, and that's the same way I do all my panels too. Um, okay. So if you have any supports or anything, um, it'll like the steel supports, it just, we, you have to notch it into those stops that come in behind it. Um, I, I, I like worked with this fabricator, Brady Dollar Hyde, and he does all my um, mm -hmm. all my frames for me. And he and like he's used to doing huge, crazy installations and um, stuff that's like heavy and delicate. So he's like the perfect person to work with on all this. I don't do any of that stuff myself. I don't trust it. 
Because you also have to know how to install it, you know, like, uh, yeah. And that's a totally different skill. Yeah. I feel like I'm getting dark. Oh, there we go. Okay. I feel like I'm getting dark. <laughs> so we're getting dark for a second, but I know as I'm watching you, I'm like, I think maybe we can fix that in post-production, but you are okay. getting a little dark. Yeah. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, okay. So we have classes, we have custom, you had your, your retail, you have direct to consumer, right? People can buy things on your website. And then you're also featured in you have, you also wholesale your, your lamps out to larger stores. Yeah. Yeah, We do wholesale. Um, we are, I think West Elm is probably the biggest company that we're, um, with that's the only one that I do drop ship for. Um, drop ship. Tell our listeners what drop ship is. Okay. So, so wholesale is where like you have your regular wholesale terms. So for me, I have, um, I have a certain minimum. I do it by the piece. I don't do it by, by uh, amount, like a, by dollar amount. Um, so wholesale is like, these are my terms. They pay up front. They, they get a bunch and it's like a one and done deal. Like they take them all. So mm-hmm. drop ship, I never say yes to drop ship. The only reason I did was because it's West Elm and they have such a big reach. Um, they, they just photograph it, put it, put it on their website. And then I like, so if someone goes to the West Elm and they purchase a lamp, it's like one lamp. And then I get the order from West Elm. And then I still have my lead time, my two to three week lead time. And, and then I make the lamp and I ship it, but everything is handled through West Elm. Okay. So I don't have any direct communication to the customer or anything like that. I just ship. Um, but West Elm generates the shipping labels and everything. I have to go onto their portal and, and then they, they take, um, it's a little bit better percentage. Like usually wholesales 50, 50. Um, they, they, they give me a little bit more. They they only take 40%, I think. Um, so it's West Elm local. So it's all about supporting local artists. They're very cool. Like they're really wonderful to work with. Um, they put my website and my name on the product page. Um, cause they only carry nine lamps of mine. So, um, and we have like 40 or whatever. So they, people, not everybody, but some people, they know like, Oh, let me go check out this artist's website. And, and, and see so we get, yeah, we get eyes on our, um, on our actual website from a small percentage, I would say, cause most people just don't read. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, That's pretty click. <laughs> yeah. But the few people who are, um, more like, like curious and they want to know, like some people will, you know, like they want to know who made it and they want to research it and then they'll see. So sometimes we get, um, we get more work from them, but um, but yeah, so wholesale dealing, I mean, um, West Elm's the only one I drop ship. Okay. Um, and then we do, um, Sundance catalog had placed a pretty big order with us. Wholesale. Um, wholesale. Um, we have worked with Nordstrom. We've worked with urban outfitters and free people, uh, Ron Herman in Japan. Um, you know, what's funny and- is my ex-boyfriend works for Ron Herman. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the other day I was, I, um, I spoke with Flanner the other day about just like this interview today. And she mentioned Ron Herman. And I was like, why does that name sound familiar <laughs> in Japan? And then I thought about yeah. it longer and I was like, oh, that's right. Yeah. That's so anyway. Fun. Yeah. Side note. Um, the, one of the trade shows that we do normally, um, shop object here, they have a whole Japanese section and um of like vendors basically and it's really impressive stuff but it also brings in some japanese buyers mm-hmm. um, and they th- that's how we ended up getting that that connection for that order which is so cool so um, cool and then a lot of and then i have uh, my other wholesalers are just little boutiques around the country um which a lot of them have not didn't survive sadly, but there's a good amount of them left. Um, and they, they do really well for us. Like there, there's a, there's like a couple stores more like mostly California, but there's a couple stores that they keep us really busy. Um, and it's, it's fun to know that you're supporting like a small company, like the corporate ones. I'm, I'm happy to work with them because they meet my, 
it's a big order and it's a big chunk of money and it helps me with like infrastructure stuff I need to invest in. But the little guys I get the most excited about because every time they reorder, I'm like, oh, they're doing well. Right. You know, especially right. we're not so worried about Nordstrom. We're not worried about Nordstrom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, and then I think that's, yeah, that's it. We don't have like, I mean, I've only been in business six years, I guess. So, oh, ABC Carpet and Home. Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. yeah. That was one of the, that was the first, one of the first wholesale orders I got. Wow. Uh, and that was, that was like a, a really big deal. Cause that's, that place is, have you, have you been there? Have you walked around inside there before? No, I haven't been yet. I've been on their website. Okay. Next time you're in New York, I'll come to you. you, pick you up. Comes, Yeah. Well, I'll take you. Okay. Um, but my mom used to come up for work a lot when, when I was a kid, cause she's an interior designer. So she'd come up to go to the design center. Um, and she brought me a few times when I was a kid and we would go and just walk around ABC carpet and home because it's so beautiful in there. Like it is like, and then when I moved here and I was broke, I would just go in there with a cup of coffee and just everything was so gorgeous. And I remember her saying to me once when I was a kid, like, you know, that whole working starving artist thing is not like, it's, it's like, don't let it deter you. Cause she was like, look at all this stuff in here was made by an artist, you know, like at ABC homes. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember her having this moment where, um, she was like, you know, you, you can, you just have to be really smart about how you work. You need to be really determined. And, um, and so, so when I got into their store, that was like the biggest thing for me. I was like, oh, okay, your mom is so proud. Yeah. She's so sweet. <laughs> That's really sweet. That's a sweet story. Um, so for starting out stained glass artists who were starting out and they're like, I want to wholesale my stuff to stores, but I, I don't really know like what to do. Um, do you want to talk about like line sheets and kind of yeah. where you do uh, start? I think the most important thing is you, you really need to figure out and it takes a while, but it'll click at one point. Like you really need to figure out what is the best way for you to run your company and to keep it healthy. Um, so like you can't, if you really know, like this is how my company needs to function to survive and you have that really clear in your heart and in your mind, you're not going to sign a contract that's not in your best interest, you know, and these big companies are, are going to always try and get away with as much as they can. That's their job. Like, it's just like a game. They're like on their email, you know, but like they're going to, so for me, I take 50% deposit up front and then, um, I make everything. And then I take the remaining balance before I even ship. I never give goods away until, um, until I have gotten paid like fully up front. Um, but some, because our, you know, it's so much labor, the stuff is expensive. I'm not fronting them money so that I can make them st- stuff at half price, you know, right. like that's mm-hmm. not, so I, I figured out early on that that's the best way for me to work. Um, and these, these large companies, they'll try and say like, well, like we don't do that. We only do, you know, net 30 or net 90 and we don't give deposits mm. up front. And it might be a company you really want to work for or you really admire and you have to feel com- confident saying, okay, I'm just not there yet. Um, those are my terms. Um, sorry, you know, sorry, didn't work out and just walk yeah. away. And I find that most of the time, I mean, honestly, almost every time they will come back and, and either negotiate pretty close to what you need or just meet your, your needs altogether. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think as important as knowing your, what you need for your company to survive is to be polite. I, I think that, um, there's like, it's, it's all like being polite, not burning bridges, holding your ground, but like as soon as you're nasty with someone, then that's it. They're not ever going to, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. and there's a tendency to want to get that way because you're like, they're, they're pushing you and they're making you, um, like assert yourself over and over and over again. Um, 
but like realizing that there's no reason to get emotional about that and just say like, you're doing your job. I'm doing my job. Um, and normally what I try and say is like, um, I'm so sorry. My company's just not there yet. Um, maybe in the future when we have like more cash flow, um, we can do something like that, but it's just not in the cards right now. Um, and then typically if they're even talking to you, they really want your stuff and like, right. they'll, they'll find a way, but, but for them, if they can get your work with, without any deposit up front, and then they don't have to pay you until 30 days after they get it. So they they're have a chance do it. to sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, of course they're going to keep trying to do that. And they know you're desperate and they know you're hungry, you know? So you just right. have to be like, really like, nope. I mean, working trade shows helped me too, because you're saying your terms over and over and over and over again. So if someone comes up and they're like, well, I don't do deposits up front. You're just like, okay. <laughs> Cool. You know, that's all right. <laughs> you know, <That's> <laughs> yeah. But like, just like, I think it's, it's, I can't like stress enough, like how important it is to be friendly and polite in the face of anything, because it is such a small world. It's smaller than you think, you know, and yes. like, I'm, yeah, like every, every other vendor I've ever been beside at a show or a craft fair or a trade show or anything that like I saw being rude, I'm still hearing about it 10 years later, you know, like it is, it is like such a intense, um, small little community. So yeah. yeah. Or travels, be nice. Be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what advice would you have for a young Flannery? If she, when you first started and you were sort of oh, navigating the wholesale world? Um, well, I think not so much like a wholesale related advice, but just for starting my company, I think I, I, my advice would be to work in to your routine self care. <laughs> like, mm, okay. From the start. Um, because I, I quit my, uh, very st- stable job, which was actually, I, sh- I wanted to ask okay, you what you did so, before. Okay. So I came, um, I came into, I, I studied textile design in college um, at Savannah College of Art and Design. And I came to New York and I was doing freelance textile design. And then I ended up needing to make more money <laughs> and got into the um, like photo world. So I was like a stylist assistant for um, photo shoots, like fashion photo shoots. So steaming and ironing clothes, dressing models and stuff like that. Um, and I did that for a couple of years and I was stoked because I'm a Virgo and I got to organize. I don't like, I'm not a fashion person at all, but it was like, really, I, I liked, I like to, um, and I like the, like you're working with this huge crew and it's like so fun. Um, but then I moved after a few years into producing the catalog shoots. Um, and, and that was like, you know, that's addicting because it's really good money. You get like a, a high day rate and a couple, maybe like five or six years into that, I just hadn't done anything creative. I hadn't like used my hands and, or done anything. Um, I had money and I could travel and I could like have a, a fun life and exciting life. Um, but, but I was starting to like, like feel really bad because I had no creative practice anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended up taking a stained glass class at Urban Glass in Fort Greene here. Um, and then just got books and started uh, like continuing my studies from home. Um, and in the meantime, I ended up, this is so random. I'm trying to tell it quick because I don't want to get off track, but um I ended up working as a personal assistant to this like millionaire money manager guy. (laughs) He's like an investment banker, I guess. Um, And I had the connection because I nannied for them when I, years ago, when I first moved to New York, I was, I nannied for them for like a summer, but I loved the kids and, um, and I stayed in touch with the family and then fast forward to like, um, I don't even know when that was like seven years, six or seven years ago, they had, uh, his personal assistant went on maternity leave and they asked me to come in and help out. And then they matched my day rate for my mm-hmm. freelance. Okay. So I was like, I can't really commit to 
like several months of coming to work every day because like I've just gotten myself to this like really good place in my production career and like um and so they're like we'll match your day rate and I was like what you know that's a <laughs> so, lot yeah day rate um, perfect. yeah but I think for them it wasn't you know right. it wasn't but I was just I was I, it was not a demanding I mean it was a demanding job because the guy's like really intense but it was um it was it was not I think I was way overpaid, <laughs> but so we, um, so I did that. And then she came back from maternity leave and they liked having me there so much that they, they created a position for a second assistant <laughs> for me to be there. And, um, and I, so I stayed on for like another year. It was the highest paying job I've ever had. And because it's in the financial industry, it comes with this huge bonus at Christmas. Um, so I, I told them the whole time I was already doing stained glass. I was making lamps. I was already selling them from home at the time, but like very like nights and weekends kind of thing. Um, and I, and I, he knew that I was trying to start my own company. Um, but then he gave me this huge bonus at Christmas. Um, and I quit <laughs> like immediately <laughs> and he was like, bye. I know. He, and I, I feel bad. I actually feel really bad. Cause I stayed, um, I stayed friends with this family, like for all those years. And, um, and then they, they don't talk to me anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. And I love the, I love their kids. Like they're really big now, but like they had twins that were boy and girl twins that were four when I started nannying for them. And then there was a boy that was like a little bit older and like, those were like my best friends. Like they're like the coolest kids. I love them so much. And I've watched them grow up and like, I still have drawings they made for me back then. And, um, but they were like, yeah, like they stopped answering my <laughs> messages and stuff after that. Um, because he was like, usually I give the bonus to people and it, and it makes them stay, it like makes them commit more. And I was like, I mean, I, I loved them, but I did not like being there. And there was, um, there was like a, a one other particular person that worked there that made it really difficult mm. to want to be there. Um, and it's always one, right? <laughs> always one. Uh, so I, so I left there and I was like, so, and I had, that was my money to start, to start my company. And that's when I got a tiny little, like 200 square foot studio, which I shared with somebody. <laughs> and that's where I started. There was like a jewelry maker in there. And we, um, that's where I started my company. And then at that point, I'm so proud of myself for staying on the point in my mind. So at that point I quit my job and I'd started this glass company and I felt like I had to work myself to the bone yeah. because I had just left. Like if I had fallen short on something, but I took a day off to rest, I would beat myself up about it. Like, mm -hmm. because I shouldn't have taken that day off. I was working I was alone in the studio at first and I was working, um, I would work till like 4 a.m. I would work overnight if I had to on everything. And then my my now manager, Sacha, um, she started out as an intern because she wanted to just learn. So she worked one day a week, maybe like four hours, like not much for free. And then I ended up being able to pay her and now she's like managing my, my company. Um, but she would work until midnight with me some nights. And then it got wow. to a point where we were both like, uh, this is so bad. This is stupid. <laughs> we need like, <laughs> business hours and we need rest and we need, um, like, cause we were like, we were getting big orders and we weren't like, it was just the two of us processing them. And I didn't, it took me a while to figure out like what my lead time is and how long it actually takes to mm -hmm. make a lamp. And, um, and then learning your process so that you can figure out ways to make it easier or more streamlined took a, took a little while. So I now take weekends off. We, my staff leaves at five. I'm here till maybe six 30. Um, we're really organized, like getting, getting more organized made us realize we don't really have to work as hard. Um, I mean, we work really hard, but like, we don't have to work ourselves, like, mm -hmm. you know, to where we, like I have back problems from those early days in my, like I, I got so um, hurt at one point that I, like I got through the holiday season. I, I had a craft fair I was doing 
in Manhattan and I finished it. And then I got into bed and then I realized my back had gone out and I couldn't walk for like a week. Oh my <laughs> like, God. That's happened to me a few times. Um, so now we're like, this is, we're just making lamps. Like we're not doctors. Like this isn't that important. We don't need to, you know, so we're, um, we're all like, we hold each other accountable. My, my girls that work with me, we like take a break, stretch, look up, you know, cause we're just yeah. like this. Everything you do, you know, yes. you're hunched over. And if work. you're, t- if you're t- also make sure your table is the right height so that you aren't. That's like yeah. a good thing too. And that's tough because we're all different sizes. <laughs> but we have, um, we have stools that are different heights. We have workstations that are different heights. And we have, the, you know, those like rubber pads that you, mats that you can stand mm-hmm. on. We have a couple of those that if you stack them, it can give you more height. So we try and have different options around the studio where people can like find what works for them. Um, Cause like Sasha's super short. And then we have other employees that are really tall and I'm kind of in the middle. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. It's like this very peaceful, wonderful craft, but when you're doing it on a production scale, um, it is, it's like, it's intense on your body. And if you're not like doing yoga and stretching and taking care of yourself at home, um, you're, it's, it's easy to like really hurt yourself. Um, Is that your, so that's your advice. Make sure you take care of your body. Take care of your body and like, make sure that you're taking care of your mental and physical health, eating, sleeping, drink water, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, um, you're not gonna do good work when you're depleted like that. Yeah. Um, and, and the world's not going to go away if you take care of yourself, like the right. people that are interested in your work are still going to be there. Um, and you're actually going to be able to make more. <laughs> yes, exactly. And better quality. And like, like you make mistakes when you're tired and they can be, they can be dangerous. Like you can hurt yourself or you can like ruin a bunch of glass that you spent a lot of money on or like, um, but yeah. And I think also in like your family life or your personal life, like that was a, a big deal too, because it was so all consuming and then I, at first I was like taking weekends off, but I would be at home just on my computer, you know, like, so I, it took a minute for like my partner and I to, to realize like, or for me to hear him <laughs> that he's like, you really need to just unplug and be present and like, let's have time together on the weekends and stuff. So, yeah, um, like it's so much, it's, it's like, it's, but at the point where I am now, I'm just getting it, you know, like thinking about like you didn't, when you interviewed Neely, I didn't realize she'd been doing stained glass for 20 some years, I know. you know, like, so she's, she's got it down. It's, you know, it took me and I'm still learning. Cause I still have moments where I sort of obsess and mm-hmm. over, overdo it, you know, but yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I would say like build in self care from the start and don't pay too much attention to Instagram. Mm. Yeah. Do you feel pressure to post every day? Do you post every day? I used to in the beginning before I, now that I I have like, once I hit like over 10,000 followers, I think I'm like almost to 20 now, which isn't, which isn't like a crazy amount. But, um, in the beginning when it was just like my family and friends and I had like 200 followers, I was like really like persistent. Um, but I don't do every day now because, um, because I am making it like we're, we're actually working. We're actually making everything. So sometimes I'm like, Oh, I got to post. And I have to like take my mask off and take my gloves off and go stage something. But then also the process is so slow. Like if I took a photo every day, it'd be the same photo for like three days. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's, um, but I think more like your presence is one thing because it is, it is an important tool. It's a free tool. It's how people shop now. It's how they Mm -hmm. explore. So that is important, but more like the negative stuff that creeps in the competitive stuff, the like, um, I'm a sensitive person. Like I'll have like 50, you know, positive comments and one person will say something snarky and I'm like, why did they say that? Oh, <laughs> you know? I know I'm the worst. I'm the worst. My, I just got yeah. a, like a, a whole like lecture for my husband, like yesterday about this. Cause I got like a, a mean DM. Oh, you did. I did. 
What's and wrong that I people? just, I don't know. And, you know, I've gotten like, you know, since the last mean DM, which I, there hasn't yeah. been that many. I mean, it's probably been like a year or two years since yeah. I got like a weird comment or something, but hundreds, maybe even one might say thousands of nice things have been said, but I'm like, you know, clutching my pearls, like in a position, like, you know, just so upset. That like somebody... they knew me. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Debbie Bean about this recently, um, that there's this, like, you, you have to learn this way of coping and being like, not going to carry that thing around with me. Like yeah. if, I'm, if I'm holding that, I, I, I have to set it down to pick up something good. So I just got to like, let that go. But there's this stupid thing I read that it was about like, you have like two wolves in your brain and one of them is like all the negative stuff. And then one of them is all the positive stuff in your life. Like, you know, one's like, you're a bad person. You're not original. You're this, this, and this. And the other one's like, you're doing great. You know, <laughs> like keep your head down, keep working. And it's like, you can feed one and the other one can starve. Mm-hmm. So in my mind, I'm always like, I'm going to feed the positive wolf. <laughs> yeah. Like don't give that, don't give your attention and don't give your thoughts and your feelings to, um, to, cause you're, you are feeding it. Like I actively feel that way when I'm focusing on the one like petty, weird person. That's like troll. They're trolls. I mean, they really are. They're mm-hmm. like trolling me. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just working. I'm like figuring out my life on my own and I'm busy working and I don't know how that offends people. Like I can't, it doesn't make any sense, you know? And yeah. so that's a troll. So yeah. And my partner's not even on social media. So I try and talk to him about it. And he's like, he's like, this is he's like, this you're is talking nonsense. about like a made up thing. It doesn't. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you don't know these people. And yeah. we're not built to be in contact with tens of thousands of people. We don't no. know. Like, Isn't it like, very- like evolutionarily, we're supposed to have 150 people in our tribe. Like that's like the max that are, oh. um, that mentally our mental load can take on in terms of, um, input from different yeah. personalities. I've never heard that, but that makes perfect sense because you're not like, we don't need the, we don't need to know everyone's opinion about us. Mm-hmm. And even with the, the copying stuff, like I don't even want to get into that too much because it's definitely feeding the wrong wolf. <laughs> but right. um, let's say back in the day, if there was no internet and you and I were making products and they were in a catalog for sale, like that's how people bought things back then. If they weren't going to a store, it'd be in a catalog, or even if they walked into a store and saw it, mm-hmm. um, they could take that photo out of the catalog and go and make it. And we'd never know. They could even yeah. make it and sell it. And we'd never know. And that's my point is I'm like, I don't want to know. <laughs> I, don't right. I know it. too much. I know yeah, too much. Like, yeah. like, just because you're, you know, you hashtagged stained glass pendant or whatever. And then someone else saw it and sent it to me. If mm-hmm. I didn't know it existed, it wouldn't hurt me. It wouldn't live in my brain, you know? And like, I can't stop. My photos are on my website. Anyone can look at them. Yeah. It's a, you know, like you wouldn't know otherwise. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We're not meant to know. (laughs) Yeah. We haven't evolved quick enough to like stay up with this thousands of people upon thousands of people. Um, Our brains are too small. We can't. (laughs) No peanut brain over here. I can't. Yeah. I got a shave on my head. (laughs) (laughs) I wear a child's hat. What do you expect from me? (laughs) Um, So how do you name your lamps? This is like always a really interesting thing to me. How do you name your pieces? And I thought that, that it was going to be so fun to name my lamps mm-hmm. and it actually ended up being really stressful. Like my mom came up with the Greta name mm-hmm. because she said it looked like a turban that like Greta Garbo would have worn. Oh, <laughs> um, I love that. And yeah. So she came up with that name. And then the Sabrina Moon, the first one I made was for a customer whose name was Sabrina. <laughs> that works. Like, not very original. And then, and then I, and then I, I think with um, I got like a little better. Like, like they come from like personal stuff. Like typically, I'm not like nowadays. I'm not making a lamp randomly, a design, and then trying to come up with a name. I'm starting from a certain like memory or place of inspiration. Um, and then the name will 
will be born from that. So like the moonrise sunset, that was, I was visiting my, uh, my dad's, my dad passed away when I was well, he, like, like eight years ago, I think. I'm and so after sorry. he died, I was, oh, thank you. I was visiting his like childhood friend, basically that they were like 18 years old when they met this guy, Kim and um, him and his wife, Melanie had left Arkansas and were living in Costa Rica and um, like off the grid, like had a vacation rental. And so after my dad died, I went down there for a vacation to be with them with some friends and they took us on a um, uh, moonrise sunset sail. And they kept saying it, like they just wanted to take us out to the ocean to see the, the sunset and the moonrise. And I kept thinking like, oh, that sounds so cool. And I wrote it down and I just had it in my sketchbook for a while. And then literally like years later, probably like five or six years later, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do something based off of this nice memory. And then that, that's where that lamp came from. Um, and then the orbits I posted about recently on my Instagram about how I named that lamp. Do you remember that drink, the orbits drink? It was like oh. made by clearly Canadian. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was like obsessed. It had like fuzzy balls in the drink that would like float around everywhere. And they were like bright different colors. I don't even know what it was. It wasn't tapioca, but they were in these bottles and it was basically like a flavored seltzer. And they had these like fuzzy bright colored balls and they like float around and you get them so in your you, mouth. Okay. They do go into your mouth. Oh, so they like boba? Yeah. They weren't because boba's tapioca, right? I, I think. Um, I don't know. I well, hate they might've been, but they felt different. Um, it probably was not something we should ingest, <laughs> but I remember it had like a wide mouth and my brother and I would be like, ah, you know, like <laughs> we would, it was like a treat for us. You know, whenever we're like on a road trip, you get your like road trip snacks. Mm-hmm. And we were obsessed with them. And I, I found one, like, I don't know, as an adult years later and tried it and they're so gross, <laughs> but I had a memory of that. And that's where that lamp came from. So they're all like weird, vague stuff from my, just like bouncing around in my brain. But <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I like that better. I mean, with, well, with my stuff, the first two series, I did the moons of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn, the names were, uh-huh. they were already made up by NASA. So I, I was yeah. just like, yeah. I would like make a piece and then I would just like go down the list of names of ones that I hadn't used yet and be like, this feels <laughs> like a, a, this. And so I, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's a nice way to do a scene. Yeah, totally. And now I'm into a new yeah. series where I have to think of the names myself and um, I'm like, dang, this is way harder than I, than I haven't it's had to so do hard. this. Yeah. This is so hard. That's why I, when we do the nightlight drops, I just do number one, number two, number three, <laughs> like we can't name them all They're you know? Yeah. And I'll say like you, the way you do your business and a lot of the other artists where you're, every piece is one of a kind, you're photographing, doing all your photography, posting the website, doing your newsletter. I only do that for the night lights and I can't stand it. <laughs> like it is so exhausting yeah. to have to come up with that, all that content every single time. It's so much work. It's like more work than, than it's twice as much work as making the pieces, you know, it is I, cause I photograph everything one time and then, um, and then they're made to order. So like, I, I, I have so much respect for you for like how much work that is to, I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing something wrong. I have so much respect for you (laughs) and what you're doing. I need to get on your, on your page. Um, so you have five people working for you and do they all have a different like job? Like is one person that I like girl and like one person's doing all of the admin work and one person, like, how does it, Oh, I do all the admin work. I do all the intake of, um, all the customer relations stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I do all of that still. And I do all the designing and, um, glass buying and all that stuff. Um, so Sacha is probably the, she is the one that knows everything I know, right? Like she can, like, if something came up and I, you know, God forbid was like sick or something and couldn't come to work for like a couple of weeks or a month, like she could, she could handle stuff. Like she knows how to do almost everything. Um, so she trains, she is like in charge of making sure, I only kind of communicate to her about all the the, the big picture stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have let her have full reign of 
organizing the way our production goes the way that she wants and um, organizing the studio and making a schedule like everything is like our grinders are cleaned once a week and um, like like every day starts and ends with a cleaning and Mm because like you got to keep you can really mess yourself up if you've got like a little speck of glass somewhere you know Mm -hmm. Um, and then everyone else our goal is to have everybody fully trained so anyone can come in. Um, we have a bit, a huge dry erase board that's like 12, I don't know, is it 12 feet long? It's like the size of a big classroom chalkboard. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of our orders are up there. And the goal is that people can come in and like eventually just like look at one and, and pick up what needs to be done next. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's like a column for where we are in production. So it'll be like, you know, all of these lamps need to be cut and these need to be gone and these need to be foiled and soldered. And then, so when, when one person does something, they change the status on the board. So then like the next, so there doesn't need to be a whole lot of communication except for in the beginning of the day, you know, we'll, we'll tell people, can you guys all focus on this? And then we're, we're trying to train everyone to be pretty self-sufficient mainly because Um, if we get another lockdown from the Delta variant, we'll have to be coming in 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 shifts. Yeah. Um, so the pandemic made us change our entire way of working because we did have to come in like alone. Like we, we couldn't be in here at the same time for a while. And there were a few of us doing everything. Um, so, uh, so yeah, our right now people have certain roles because a few people aren't fully trained um, but they still have to learn like soldering and stuff like that. But once everyone's fully trained, our goal is that, um, anyone can come in and just like make a lamp, do the wiring, do the packing, all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Were you, have you ever been somebody's boss before this job? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. And it's, uh, it's hard because, um, I want to be everybody's friend, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and I, I'm, Like, I feel pretty, I'm like extremely lucky. The people that have like gravitated towards me and that I've gravitated towards, um, like I'm in New York. So there's all these artists here. All my employees are artists in completely different fields. Mm -hmm. Um, They do their, they have their own focus and um, they're going out in the world and they're all mostly past the party stage. So like they're, deeply um dedicated to their own own practice Mm -hmm. and so on their time off they're they're going to museums and doing their own work and coming in and they're like you know they're motivated and inspired by all these other things and um I love the studio environment like what with other people like that's my favorite that's what I miss the most about college and um I'm sometimes I like to be alone in the studio but for the most part, I really like being around other people who are busy and creating like that feeling when there's like several people in a room, like just with their head down in the zone is like, is the best thing, you know, it, it's like the room's like buzzing, you know? Yeah. Do you guys listen to music or anything while you work? <laughs> we put music on, but um, it's kind of too loud mm-hmm. with, with all the, with, if the grinder's going and the ventilators and stuff. Um, and we actually have a water jet machine. Um, so when we have a, a high, really high production, um, we will, we'll use that to, to cut some of the glass. Mm. Um, it, we only have, turn it on when there's a lot of production because it's not efficient for like small runs. Yeah. Um, but that's really loud. So with, um, and since we got on West Elm, we have to, that's part of our production. So we pretty much, we have that running probably three days a week. Yeah. Uh, so it's just so loud. So what we, what we do is most people have headphones in and they're listening to podcasts or whatever they, whatever they want. And if the Wazer is not, it's called a Wazer. If the Wazer is not on. They're listening to Cracked. I'm sure they're listening to Cracked. Uh, yep. Well, yes. we've all listened to Cracked. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is, this is your next, um, as a boss, this is part of the, the job description is that you have to listen to this podcast while you work. Yeah, exactly. To, and nothing else. Nothing else. <laughs> over and over and on a loop. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it is, but, but that's the, that's the thing is it's like, 
I, I don't want to micromanage people. Like when, when I train my staff, I, I have a, um, I like for them to learn the way I do it, Mm -hmm. but if they want to experiment and learn on their own and come up with different ways of doing things, as long as the end product is still timely and looks good and the quality control is there, like I'm totally okay with them finding their own way to do it. And because they're all artists, like we've changed a lot of our production around things that, um, that my staff has come up with, um, new ways to do things or, um, you know, polish or wire or actually like, this is super exciting. Um, last month, a friend of mine who, uh, is a, he makes prosthetics for (laughs) a living. Um, he helped me make silicone molds of my lamps so that we can streamline the 3d building part of it and get it like more accurate. Um, so like we're constantly, that's what's so cool about a small work environment. Like if you come up, if you're like, maybe this would be easier, we can try it. And then we have enough orders coming in where I can be like, can you guys try it this way for this week? And then at the end of the week, they can be like, I don't think it made a difference or, Oh, that was way better. And then we can go forward with it. So, yeah. Yeah. That's like really the strategy cool. part is really exciting to me. That is, and it, you're a good boss in the sense that you are open to um, growing and changing. And because there's a little part of that of being not, well, I don't want to say being wrong, but I could see how somebody that wasn't very um, yeah. confident being like, no, like my way is the way and not being open to. Um, well, and though, and like that's a, a fine tuned kind of thing. Like there were, there's personality types that work in this environment and they're, types that don't. I've only had to actually fire two people, I think. And it sucked. Like I still like, my heart is still like damaged from it. It, Cause when you have to fire somebody, like it's like a, a breakup, like Mm -hmm. you're you're not going to end the conversation with people being happy. Like you have to be okay with, they're going to walk away. Like there, there was tears, like, you know, it, it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's like a really important thing to protect the studio culture yeah. here. Um, because one wrong person can really, really mess it up. And it, and then it's, like I said, it's hard work and I, um, you have to be very focused on everything that you're doing. I'm like, I'm pretty intense. I don't allow cell phones out. Um, there's, I don't want people scrolling or being distracted. Like you really need to pay attention. Um, like when you're cutting or soldering, there's like chemicals and heat and all this stuff. And like, I, I don't want people getting in trouble. I mean, getting hurt. So, um, so we, uh, like we have a pretty strict, like no phone rule, but I give an app, I give a 30 minute paid lunch break. And then if anyone needs to make a phone call, like some of my, you know, if I have someone with kids or whatever, we understand you just have to say, I'm going to step away, turn your soldering iron off. Like there has to be a checklist of all the things that are, you know, okay. And you have to leave your space safe for the next person that might need to come there. And, um, so like in, in some ways we're, we're lenient, but in some ways we have to be really diligent because like, you know, we had, we had an employee for a little while that would go on her lunch break and come back stoned. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I'm like, I have to say, I have to make a rule that you can't come to work stoned. <laughs> like yeah, the things you don't think you have to say, like you have to do it. And um, yeah. like I have workers comp, I have to pay all this liability and stuff because I have a dangerous situation. So I have to set up these rules where like an accident can't happen that can like burn the studio down, severely hurt somebody. We have to have a dress code. We have to like, you know, have all this stuff. Um, so that sucked in the beginning to have to come in and be like, no phones. <laughs> um, yeah. Is but then the dress the code end, just like long sleeve shirts and closed toed shoes or anything slutty? No. <laughs> 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 um, it's yeah, it's closed toed shoes, um, like like long pants. Um, but sometimes it's hot, so I, I I got aprons that people can wear if they if it's too hot for them to wear pants. Um, um, but. Like I have had to send people home at some point and be like, can't wear booty shorts with flip flops and like, yeah. and be like handling glass. I mean, you know, like you're, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> so yeah, that's too much, yeah. too much. Uh, yeah. 
Do you, um, I've noticed in some of your Instagram photos that you guys wear like full on like respirators when you're soldering. So tell me about those. And then also what is your ventilation system like in your studio? We wear the big respirators because it's like, like for us, someone might be soldering all day, you know? Yeah. I think the production is like, it's hard like for people to, to realize like, like, I mean, this week, I think we had like over 20 lamps to make or something. So so some, whoever is soldering, that will be what they do all day long. So mm-hmm. it's a little different when you're like just doing it for like an hour or something right. like that. And, um, so we wear the respirators, um, gloves. I have the little desktop ventilators that have the charcoal filter, you know, mm-hmm. which those are, mm-hmm. those are, yeah, you have one. Yeah. And those aren't great because you have to be like right next to a few inches away from what you're working on mm-hmm. a smoke absorber to like catch the smoke. But then we open windows, doors. I have um, uh, what do you? Call? I have two of the like HEPA air purifiers. Um, so we were pretty set up for the yeah. pandemic. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> like That's we already amazing. have all that stuff, and and we we wipe all our glass down with rubbing alcohol before we foil. So I had gallons of rubbing alcohol, and tons of gloves and masks, and so like when the pandemic hit, and everyone was like scrambling to get all that stuff. I was like, Oh, <laughs> right. You're like, well, nobody's buying lamps right now, but I am I know, selling alcohol. Right. <laughs> we're like, yeah, we're doomsday preppers. I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's true. I did have like so many masks cause I gave yeah. them to my students. And so I had boxes and boxes of these yeah. know, legit masks. And yeah. Then- yeah. And I like, I, I want to have I do- everybody. I want you to know, I donated them to the hospital. Oh, good. good. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to, um, do like those the, the more like intense ventilation systems where it's like a pipe that comes from the ceiling yeah. and, um, but my ceilings aren't that high mm. and the space is pretty small. So, um, I don't know. I'm always trying to think of ways to like still make it better because when we do have a lot of people in here and maybe two people are soldering and then there's other people foiling, like when it's, when the weather's nice and we can open all the windows or sometimes we'll even work. We have like a tiny little cement backyard here. Mm-hmm. We'll put a folding table. So if people want to sit out there, they can, but we have so much extreme weather here. So it's, it's like a pretty small portion of the year where that's an option. Um, so that's where our like production schedule has to be pretty, like if, if there's a day where someone's got to be in here soldering all day long and we can't, and it's raining, we're not going to have people sitting in there foiling all day. So we have to be like kind of flexible and mindful of keeping it, keeping it safe. Um, yeah. Were you guys okay during the hurricane? I just remembered, realized that you're, we were, well, hurricane Henri (laughs) was coming right for, cause I live in the Rockaways. I live, I live at the beach. Um, so the hurricane was coming right for us and everyone was really scared because the Rockaway community got pretty devastated during Sandy. There's still parts that aren't rebuilt Mm -hmm. and that hit, um, high tide full moon was why that was so devastating. Mm. And it was looking like the exact same conditions for that hurricane, but it diverted and it didn't, it didn't come to us. And then Ida, um, we were fine at Rockaway, but I did get stuck in that. I was walking through water above my knees in Brooklyn during that flash flood. Whoa. It was crazy. The videos Um, on, oh my God, God, of the water in the subways. Yeah. Now this might not be a question you can answer and this has nothing to do with stained glass, but there, I saw this video where there was like this waterfall coming down the subway steps, which probably needed a cleaning anyway, let's be honest. But then, (laughs) but then the water was like up to like the landing where the train pulls up. Where are the trains? Are, do they pull them? Is there a place they pull them out of the subway or are they just filled up with water? Are they waterproof? They are not waterproof because the, the doors, like they would come in the doors. Um, the trains, like there are parts of their track. I mean, some of the trains would be underground the entire way, but most of them have a part of the track that is like above ground. Um, well, service and stuff. Right. And they have to have a place where they can well, go in and out. For... They service them down there. You know, I don't really know the answer to that because there's also, you always hear about the third rail, like it's electric. So yeah. I'm sure the flooding kind of like makes everything 
stop running. I mean, it seems like super dangerous. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, those places that flooded like that, they, those are the places that always flood. Um, it's like, like that part of Greenpoint where the, all the videos were, I, were the, I don't know if you saw the ones, there was like the busy bee. You see the grocery store called busy bee in the background. It's just like, there's like an actual like current. Um, that's, and I was stuck right there. Um, that place always floods during big rain. So it's like, it's same with Philly. It was so bad in Philly, the school river. I don't know if you saw those videos raised so high that there's like an overpass over the highway and the water was like under the overpass. Whoa. So like, I don't know, what is that? Like a hundred feet of space. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, all those, it's like the infrastructure is bad. The infrastructure of the city, the infrastructure of the subway has been neglected for so long. Yeah. So like, I don't know, in New York, like those places flood like, like crazy all the time. So that flash flood, like I was at a bar. I never stay in Brooklyn, but I was watching my friend's dogs and I, I was like, Oh, I get to finally like stay in Brooklyn and go out and have a drink. So I don't have to drive an hour home. And I was at a bar with my friend and it wasn't super late. And the bartender was like, I got to close the basements flooded. And the, mm. there was like water, like up to his shoulder. And we were like, what? And someone went to the door and opened it and water just started coming in. <laughs> to the bar. Oh my God. And, and we just like both ran. Cause I was watching my friend's dogs and she's got a basement apartment. And I was like, Oh my God, the pets are down there. So we both ran opposite ways to go home. And luckily my friends on like a part of the block, that's like a little elevated and she was fine where, where I was staying. But the friend I was having a drink with, she lost everything. She lost her, everything in her home. Her, her business was in her basement she lost it all on that flood and she's like displaced so right now looking for a new, I'm so sorry. It's getting so dark. I know. <laughs> you are, you are getting darker and darker and darker. Like, I don't know what to do. I'll keep it. There we go. If I just do this, <laughs> just keep your hands up. For the... Well, um, we can kind of wrap this up since, okay. you're, okay. since you're fading into the shadows. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. There's just a couple more questions I really wanted to ask you. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite artist? Um, oh my gosh. I, have, I had to write this down because I have so many. Um, so I love, I like to look at like interior design and like, I, I think of myself as a stained glass artist, but as, as like a, um, a lighting designer, mm -hmm. you know, mostly there's a woman named Katie Stout. I don't know her personally, but her Instagram is, um, smile. U M M M smile. Okay. Um, and she does these sculptures. She does these light fixtures that are so incredible. Like they're, I don't know if they're ceramic or paper mache, but they're like, they're just like wacky bright. They're like, they look kind of like weighted kinetic kind of um, cool. chandelier. Um, I love her stuff so much. Um, there is a show I'm going to tonight, a reception opening for this printmaker named Takuji. His Instagram handle is um, T-A-K-U-J-I-H-A-N-G-A. -A and he does these um, woodblock print collages that are like, I've never seen anything like them. They're really beautiful. They're bright colors. They all, They look like the way like a prism of light would maybe like reflect rainbows all around but mm -hmm. he does this like his stuff is so beautiful and I met him because recently there was another stained glass artist who um passed away Mary Clark and Higgins um and she was like the restoration lady in New York um like she has done the most like Im important work like worked on like old Tiffany's and like just like the craziest, like if you had something important to be restored from a museum or anything like that, like that's the girl. And um, she passed away in December and Takuji is her, was her uh, apprentice or assistant. And he contacted me and was like, do you wanna come get some of the, buy some of the stuff from her um, studio? And he's this master printmaker. And, um, and we, my whole staff, like we're all just so obsessed with, him and his knowledge and his, cause he's, he knows so much about stained glass um, and is very like, was very generous with us with like all our crazy questions. And, um, but he doesn't do stained glass anymore. 
um, he didn't want to continue the practice. So we're going to his opening reception tonight in a gallery in the Upper East Side. Um, cool. And for stained glass, um, have you heard of Christy um, Cavataro, I think is her name? I don't think um, so. C-A-V-A-T-A-R-O. Um, a friend of mine sent me her work. She does these like insane copper foiled sculptures. They're, they, they're like tiny pieces and they're like these weird tubes. I don't know how she does them, but I'm totally obsessed. They're like, I can't imagine how she like closes the, the pieces and solders them, but definitely look up her stuff. She is doesn't, it, I don't think. Is it with glass like, too, or just copper foil sculptures? Yeah. It's like little tiny squares or rectangles that she does them small enough where she can make these tubes. And they're probably like this big, oh. um, but they're like, I don't, I can't even explain them. They're so cool, but hope maybe you can like pull up some photos when you do the video, but, um, I will, I will. and hers, you would just go to her website. Um, and it's Christy K R I S T I. And then her last name is C A V A T A R O.com. Okay. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I just love, like, for me, I, I love like, and the cool thing, maybe I'm nostalgic about leaving New York, but I love um, like all the, all the old school, like hotels and stuff here that have original paintings um, from like masters and the bars and stuff like mm -hmm. um, you can go to the cafe Carlisle there's like a a bar in the Carlisle hotel there's the Bemelman's bar which is hand-painted wallpaper of all the it's the guy that did the Madeline series yes so it's like all these like beautiful like hand-painted wallpaper of all his little creatures on the lampshades and everywhere um, and then across from the hall, there's another venue and, uh, there's a French muralist that I'm just obsessed with, with him. He's a fashion, um, illustrator, I think Marcel, um, Ver Verte, V E R T E S. Um, and he just did these large scale, like incredible drawings in there. So when you're sitting down, they're like massive behind you, um, I'm kind of obsessed with all of that kind of stuff that that plays with scale right now, and and um, it's all more gestural like um, stuff than than the way that I work. But um, it, it really changes the space that you're in in a, cool. in a big way. So, yeah, that's kind of my uh, <laughs> yeah. Love that's my, those. Those are totally yeah. yeah. I'm gonna check all of those out as soon as we get off okay. this call. And then um, final question. Mm -hmm. who do you nominate to be on the podcast next? And this has to be a stained glass artist. Okay. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I don't know if this one's possible, but because they're in Korea, <laughs> but have you seen light bones, glass art, light bones, underscore glass art on Instagram. No. I'm obsessed with, it's this group. They, they have this like studio called Sillyville <laughs> And they they do these really cool stained glass. It seems like they're they're like kind of into like fashion and like the tattoo culture. But it's this group of artists that um, work in Korea. And I've actually bought some stuff from them and had it shipped over. And um, I don't know if you could like work out an interview with them. I don't even know if they speak English. But um, but like I'd love to know what it's like to for them in another country to find what it's like for them to do the same stuff that we do. Yeah, I know. I, there's another stained glass artist that I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, that's in J Japan. And okay. And I sent them a message and I asked them if they wanted to be on the podcast. And I was thinking, well, I guess we could just do, because I'm doing this via Zoom. And so I was like, yeah. well, I can do like a like three people. And maybe we could just have like a translator and yeah. then um, just edit out the, trans um, the translator basically yeah. when they're repeating my question just to kind right. of like – your time but yeah um yeah maybe we could figure that out yeah um but yeah I think it's it's really cool to see um to see their workspaces in different countries to see like oh that's like oh that's the same ventilator I have or it's like a totally different thing or the same tools or yeah. um but if you can't contact them then I'm sure you're going to talk to Janelle Fu 
Did you have uh, her on? I'm an- interviewing her September 30th. Okay. All right. Oh, I, yeah, I would, I'd love to hear more from her. We're, we, we're kind of like internet friends, but um, she's yeah. just blown up recently. So it's, she's doing so much um, work. Um, yeah. Like activism work for, um, for, yeah, well, I want yeah. to, I have so much I want to talk to her yeah, about, but yeah. she's, I, she's using her work for so much good. And I really want to, <laughs> <laughs> this seems to work. I don't know why. <laughs> and it's working. Um, yeah. yeah I want to talk to her. Hands are like... <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm like so proud of her and hearing, um, like, like all those like big corporate companies that have come in to like lift her voice up and, yeah. And I think that she handled it with such great poise and, and, and talk about shitty comments. Like she's dealt with so much crazy oh, stuff. God, you know? Yeah. If um, you guys are listening great. before she comes on, I know we'll talk about this before, when she gets here, but she started um, something called create to stop hate. And it's a ton of artists who have gotten involved for um, basically they make a piece and then they um, auction it off to um to, to raise money for like larger organizations that are, um, in support of the AAPI community. So yeah. it's, um, it's really cool what she's doing. It's so yes. cool. Yeah. Yeah. She, I mean that, did she do multiple rounds of it? I, I only kind of watched the first round. Um, I think but she, the first one with all the artists that got involved, it did, it did so well. It was like, and then the fact that she's still doing her own work, I She's know. still managing to do her own work through all of that. I mean, I feel like this, they're, they're, how does she have any time in her day for anything? I know. I know. The work that she's doing is so important and yeah. she's just such an inspiration. So I'm really, really looking forward to that interview. I think that she's she's a powerhouse. I yeah. need to also learn from her how she's doing all this because even though I'm not really doing like any activism with what I'm doing, I'm trying to figure out like, how do I do a podcast and a YouTube video, but also be a stained glass artist still? Like yeah, I gotta exactly. like, you know, walk the and walk and talk the talk. Yeah. Yeah. And a mom. And a mom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That too. Um, yeah. But yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. So I, I'm excited to hear that one. Um, and then and then I know that Neely had mentioned Patrick Hurley, Pizza Donkey. Yes. He's taking a it. break for the summer. We emailed. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. He's taking a break for the summer, but um, he is going to come back. Okay. Stronger than ever. And as soon as he gets back in the game, then we're going to, we're going to reconnect. And okay, good. Yeah. On. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And he, he's cool. Um, I like following his, his whole career because he, he started as, I think he was a teacher in New York and then he moved to California and mm. um, um, just like Neely said, he's like really good at like, at like very clearly expressing the boundaries and all the pricing structure and, um, and he's got, I, I mean, I think his work is so cool. I love, I love all of the, all the stuff that he creates and his original drawings and, yeah, and he seems like to the- do it well. Yeah, he's yeah. like the Tom of Finland of, yeah. of stained glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, his work is amazing. It really is good. I mean, there's so many people now in the world. So I'm just excited that you're doing this podcast. And because um, like even in the few I've listened to so far, it's so cool to hear the creative process from different artists. Like we're all kind of like existing in the same world, but I feel like we all have like different ways of going about things and um, like... Yeah. I don't know. I felt like there should be a part two for Neely because I want to hear more about the maker's mark. <laughs> yeah. That's, you're not the first person who said that, that there should okay. be like a follow-up cool. once the maker's mark thing is finished. Yeah. Um, and also another thing I want to say about the podcast is that um, I was talking to my friend, Jamie yesterday, who is a musician. Hi, Jamie, you're listening. I'm sure. Um, <laughs> she was saying that she, um, <laughs> she, uh, that's okay. Um Give it a shooter. <laughs> uh, I know you have a, a, a castaway back there. Um, she was saying that she loved listening to the um, podcast and she really took something from when Debbie Bean was saying how she took her email off of her phone. Cause oh no yeah. Last emergency. I know. I was like, that's smart. <laughs> it's so smart. But I think that there's, there's just so much to be said for just being a small business owner. And, you know, we talk about a lot more than just tools. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, and also hearing um, like the way Neely like so casually mentioned how she got her inspiration for the Maker's Mark drawings. Yes. And like, like that was so cool to, cause like, just like, it was just like a very like comfortable, I don't know, casual way that she was mentioning like pulling inspiration from the woman who actually like didn't get much credit for doing all of the yes. bottle design. And, um, Margie Samuels. And then, Margie Samuels. And then the, the acorn, like being part of the oak casks, but also like passing a generational. On. Yes, yeah. I know. You can come in. My employees here. <laughs> it must be 12. <laughs> We've yeah. been jabbering away for a while. Yeah. yeah. This is okay. <laughs> sorry, everybody. This is going to be a long episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let you get to it. Um, thank you so much for, for doing this and joining me today. I have yes. learned so much amazing, wonderful things that I, I love you even more now. Um, oh, thank yeah, you. Your story is great. You. Oh, I love you. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I will talk to you soon. Okay. Have a wonderful, productive day today in the studio. Okay, thank you. You as well. Thanks thank for having you. me. Absolutely. Bye. <laughs> to see more of Flannery's work, her Instagram is at friend of all glass, F R I E N D O F A L L G L A S S. And my Instagram is at Runa Glassworks, R U N A G L A S S W O R K S. Give us a follow and you guys, please shoot me a DM if there's someone you want to nominate to be on the podcast or if there are any specific questions you want me to be asking these artists. With some of my next guests, I'll be introducing a segment where I'll read questions from our audience. So I need those questions. All right, my little crackheads. I'll see you next time.